Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kadiga Tavaraj. Thank you for joining us today for the 35th anniversary of Tamil Journeys 86. I am coming to you today from Toronto, the Dish with One Spoon territory, which is covered by Treaty 13 and the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Wendat, and the Haudenosaunee. On August 11th, 1986, 155 Thummels were found stranded on lifeboats off of the coast of Newfoundland. In an attempt to find a home where they could live free from persecution, they had spent nearly two weeks on a merchant vessel and then were stranded for over three days at sea with little to no food and water before being found and rescued by a crew of local, uh, a local fishing crew. As a local newspaper wrote at the time that someone would pay thousands of dollars and embark on such a dangerous voyage risking death just to get a hearing for a life in Canada, because of course they were not guaranteed to be allowed to stay and there were certainly plenty of people at the time who didn't believe they should be allowed to, that is indicative of the terrors they faced. And today's 35th anniversary is a marker of the resilience of those people the generosity and open-heartedness of their rescuers, and a reminder of the importance of the rights of refugees and how we cannot take these rights for granted. Before we move to our first speaker today, I will also say that the portion of St. John's where the refugees stayed when they first arrived are the ancestral homelands of the Beothuk, whose culture has now been erased forever. And I'd like to acknowledge that the island of Newfoundland is the unceded traditional territory of the Beothuk and the Mi'kmaq. Today and always, we must remember that reconciliation with our Indigenous communities on this land is crucial, and with the exception of these communities, that we are all settlers on this land. To start off marking and commemorating Thumble Journeys 86, I'd like to welcome uh, Sinmay Sivakumar to sing the national anthem and Thamalpai Balthu. Sinmayi is an accomplished singer and, and a supporter of many Tamil community initiatives.
Thank you. Thank you, Sibaye. We will now welcome someone who needs no introduction, the president of the Canadian Thumbel Congress, Mr. Simon Alungo. Sorry, Mr. Alungo, I think you're muted. Apologies, we seem to be having some sound difficulties. Just bear with us just for one moment. Perhaps we can move to the next item and then have Mr. Lungo come back after. And so the next item we have on our agenda today is a video presentation regarding the events of 1986. And next, we will welcome back Mr. Sivanelango. Thank you, Kartika. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Canadian Tamil Congress, I would like to welcome all of you to today's event, the Tamil Journey 1986. 155 Tamil men, women, and children, all of them originally from Sri Lanka, 
boarded a merchant vessel, Regina Maris, with the hope of a new life in Canada after fleeing Sri Lanka because of the widespread and consistent discriminations and violence against Tamils. After being at sea for six weeks, they were placed in two 28-foot boats, lifeboats, by the vessel captain and asked to steer in a particular direction to reach Montreal. In reality, these men, women and children were dropped off in a risky region of Atlantic near Newfoundland. They were adrift for three days, running out of food and water, and they all believed that they would die of either drowning or starvation. In the midst of their terror, they prayed and hoped someone would save them before the boat sank. On August 11, 35 years ago today, the late Gus Dalton, captain of Atlantic Reaper, a fishing trawler and his crew spotted these two lifeboats with people screaming for help off the shores of St. Charles, Shorts, the southernmost town in Newfoundland. Gus Dalton immediately radioed the boats in the area with the support of his crew, Thomas Power, John, John McEnvoy, and Joe Maldoni went into action. To ensure adequate space, Gus and his crew dumped their cash worth of thousands of dollars and took in as many from the boats as they could and alerted the Canadian Coast Guard. They immediately shared all the food and water they had with the refugees who were very grateful. After a difficult and dangerous journey across the Atlantic at the time when these men, women and children had just about lost hope, Gus and his crew brought them safety. All of the Tamil refugees were treated with dignity and initially housed at Memorial University and taken care of by the kind people of Newfoundland before they were flown to Montreal and Toronto to join the Tamil Canadian community in those cities. The Prime Minister Brian Mulroney and his Minister of Immigration Jerry Weiner made a decision to welcome them all 155 and grant them refugee status in Canada. As quoted by Jerry, we know people that arrive on our shores in boat must never be turned away. They have now settled well and continue to contribute in every way to the cultural, social and economic fabric of Canada. If not for Gus Dalton and his crew and others who helped, it is possible that these 155 refugees may have perished at sea. Tamil Canadians are ever so thankful to Gus Dalton, his crew, people of Newfoundland and the government of Canada for their kindness. At that time, many Canadians also criticized the refugees, commenting that they were jumping the queue, bypassing the formal immigration system and taking advantage of Canada refugees law and wanted the government to send these refugees back to their country of origin where they no doubt would have faced significant sanctions, including possibility of prison. However, Prime Minister Brian Mulroney and his government determined that the refugees were indeed genuine and decided to accommodate them in Canada. This decision was a milestone in the history of Tamil Canadian and the community will always remember this act with deepest gratitude. Over the years, Tamil Canadians have expressed their gratitude to Captain Dalton for his selfless and heroic actions. He was first honored by CTC in 2011 at a small dinner in St. John's with his family and friends in attendance. Captain Dalton was also the recipient of CTC's Leaders for Change Award, presented in January 2012 at annual Thaipongal dinner in Toronto. In August 2016, over 135 Tamil Canadians, including some who arrived on the board in 1986, visited Newfoundland and and hosted a last banquet to honor Captain Dalton and other fishermen involved in the rescue, as well as the Canadian Coast Guard, thanked the community for their warm hospitality 30 years ago. CDC also obtained one of the lifeboats which was displayed at Tamil Fest. When our current Prime Minister, Honorable Justin Trudeau, visited Tamil Fest, he had a chance to inspect the boat and meet some of the Canadians who undertook this risky voyage in search of a better life. In addition, CTC also displayed the board in Kingston, Montreal, Ottawa as part of Canada 150 celebrations. We want to take this opportunity to thank Diana Express Limited for transporting the board from Newfoundland to Toronto and keeping and preserving the board for future displays in a museum. 
We want to thank Dalton family and all our speakers for joining us today and all the support you have provided. We also want to thank MP Gary Ananda Sangari for his leadership and support in Tamil Journey Initiative and all the work he has done, including being in touch with Gus Dalton family over the years. Finally, we thank Cyrus Singh for being part of today's event and also doing the documentary. Once again, on behalf of Canadian Tamil Congress, we thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alongo. We will now hear from a very special guest, someone who was among the 155 on the boats that day or who arrived that day and is living now in Toronto and running a highly successful business, Mr. Siva Mehanadan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to Gus Dalton and other fishermen who saved the, li uh, saved the live boats because without you, I would not be here today. Thank you to the governor, Canadian government who accept me and 154 people in his country. The whole experience was scary and I did not think would we would make it, but with the God's grace, Gus and other fishermen come to save us also, thank you to the Gary Ananda Sangari because without your effort, the story of 155 people stand it would have gone unheard. I was blessed with a second chance at life by Gus, the fisherman who helped him and the government of Canada, and I am truly. Grateful. Gus Dalton Illy and the Nangal Nuti Ambatin Jiperin, Kadali Mulgi Ripum, our Avernan or Godfather Avatam Park Rain, our day Rivi Charanga Kuda Nan Sendri, Newfoundland, another Kandir Malga, another Nandi Uri Atir and then Iteranam Avericum, our day Kudum within Ericum, and a Nandri Aim on the Anada Bangarin Terri to Kuluri, Nandri Wanaka. Andrew, Mr. Sivan uh, Mayanathan. Next up, we have a pillar of our community and someone, as you've heard, who is integral to our first commemorations of these events, uh, our member of parliament, Gary Anand Sangari. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kartika. And um, um, thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. I am uh, joining you from the traditional lands of many Indigenous nations, most recently uh, after Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, I am uh, pleased to be joined by uh, the Minister of Immigration, Marco Mendocino, the former M Minister of Immigration, um, Jerry Weiner, um, and of course, Jack Harris, who is uh, the current and retiring member of parliament for St. John's East and who I knew Gus quite well. Um, I am very grateful for this opportunity and I'm thankful that this uh, event uh, is taking place, albeit virtually. I, I would have wished to visit uh, my family in Newfoundland. I call them my family because over the last 10 years, um, the, the Dalton sisters have become an integral part of uh, my life. Um, and both Gus and Margaret have uh, have welcomed me into their home and my family uh, many, many times. And I'm so grateful uh, that I was able to uh, know Gus at least in the last few years of his life. Um, as you recall, we were able to secure a, a medal for him uh, through the Governor General's office. Uh, finally, uh, almost 30 years after his heroic rescue, recognition of, of his uh, enormous contribution to, to Canada. And I'm very grateful uh, that uh, the, the Governor General was able to bestow that on him. And that was given by uh, the Lieutenant Governor of Newfoundland, uh, the Honorable Judy Foote. Um, the families uh, of the individuals and families like Sivana who came on the boat have, have been my inspiration. Um, Sivana is someone I've known for, for maybe 25 years and whose, um, whose hard work and dedication has inspired me. But it's also a reflection of the true um, contributions of refugees uh, make to countries like Canada. And I'm, I'm not, I know that the, the other 154 individuals and their families are equally um, very, um, 
very appreciated, but also give back to this country in, in strides. And I want to thank them for their enormous uh, contribution. Um, at that time, the Tamil community was very small, and I know uh, Erle Yankel and uh, you know others who were instrumental in in supporting uh, those who came uh, were leaders and and continue to be leaders and and guides for us uh, of the great achievements that they did in the past, including securing the special measures program in 1983 post uh, anti Tamil program that uh, enabled Tamils to settle. Uh, in Canada with the first 1,800 that came through that program. But the uh, the, the uh, families um, were supported by a very generous community in Toronto, but most importantly, Canadians across Canada. The uh, commemoration is so important today, and I know, uh, look forward to Cyrus's presentation of In the Wake of Time, uh, but this collaboration with CTC is also important because we do need to mark this history. The reason why this is important to me is I was uh, 13 years old when um, this, uh, 14 years old when, when the boat uh, came in 1986. Um, this impacted me enormously as I went back to school. There was uh, bullying, there was a great deal of um, anti-Tamil sentiments across Canada, but particularly uh, in the greater Toronto area because of the way uh, the media depict uh, this journey. Um, but it's also um, something that stuck with me throughout my time because it was also about refugees. It was about uh, the story of refugees, in this particular case, Tamils, and this particular case where Canada did well. Uh, we did the right thing, uh, but we know that that has not always been um, in our past. So if you look at what happened with the Kamaga Tomorrow, and then of course the shameful uh, SSN Louis uh, that was returned um, to um, to Europe uh, where um, Jews were, were killed en masse. Uh, it was a reminder that there is the best in us uh, came out in 1986, uh, but it also is a challenge for all of us who believe in the rights of refugees, and, and I, I, for one, as someone who came here as a refugee, um, I have to reiterate um, the, the one of my reasons for getting into politics is the protection of refugees, um, is a need for Canada to always be an open society in which people can come and seek uh, asylum. Canada is a very complicated country. We, settlement itself is complicated, especially in light of uh, the, the ongoing uh, colonial experiences of Indigenous people here. Uh, but at the same time, um, Canada is a, is a country that in many ways, um, recent history uh, has allowed many refugees to come here, but has not always been consistent. So this is a day for us to also recommit to ensuring that refugees um, are protected, refugees are welcome, uh, refugees will always be welcome at our shores. Um, and we did not see the same type of treatment, as you know, by the government of the day in 2009 or 2010, uh, when the Ocean Lady and the MV Sunsi arrived. But we will continue to per persevere and to ensure that um, refugees are welcome uh, to Canada. Uh, on a closing note, I know we talk a lot about Gus and his family, um, but but you know there's many other survivors uh, who now uh, continue to hold Gus's uh, mantle. Uh, I know Rom Dalton, who is Gus's nephew and who was on Gus's brother's boat um, when when uh, when in 1986, uh, was a young lad at that time, and and he will be speaking later on. Um, I do have to say that you know it, it's it's his responsibility and those uh, who are still remaining to make sure that this story goes out. The story uh, that is a great story of Newfoundland, a great story of Canada, a great story um, for Tamil Canadians. And I look forward to, uh, in, uh, to celebrating this in person with all of you, uh, particularly the Dalton family in, in Admiral's Beach, uh, where, where I know we've spent many times uh, uh, laughing and crying and, and celebrating uh, this, uh, this fabulous uh, Canadian story. And I look forward to seeing you in person. Thank you, Kartika, for this opportunity. And uh, uh, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Gary. And actually, it's fitting. We will actually just now be joined by Rom. Um, for those of you who journeyed with us and you've heard now Gary speak, those of you who journeyed with us to Newfoundland together five years ago, you'll remember our next two speakers is, I think, very appropriately introduced by Gary. We're going to have Rom Dalton and uh, Diane Dalton speak now. So I'll have bring Rom first up onto the screen, please. 
Hello folks, name is Rand Dalton. Uh, 35 years ago today was a proud day for us. Started off like any other day. Fish just a bed lemmer. Out trying to catch a few flounder, making a fine, fine living at the time, but we didn't need a lot to live in those places. Then all of a sudden we get the call from the uncle. Bunch of people in two lifeboats. We're probably a mile away from them. Weren't expecting to see what we see. That was something like a dream. But when we got to the boat, there was mostly two lifeboats full of people, one tied to the other. And uh, we didn't know what to think. So at the time, then it got coast guard was contacted. And uh, we had to wait, we couldn't take them board until we got permission from the Coast Guard, which came pretty fast. So we took them board our boats and when we did, all the people that were so hungry, you know, we didn't know how long we were in the boat, but you know, we started, you know, do you want some water? So we, had, we didn't have no running water, we had gallons of water, five gallon buckets. So we started pouring them out in cups, so cups weren't good enough fellas used to take the five gallon there and just tip it under it. It's a good waste because everyone wanted to drop. So we had to gradually share out the water. We had, had to hide a few oranges from my father because he's diabetic to keep him going for the day. We had to open up beans and put them in one pot and we had to put them in soup and put them in another. But that didn't work. They just grabbed it with their hands one after the other, car and be put in the boiler. Everybody was starved to death. You know. So those are some of the things. So then you have to put that in perspective of why the people were there. They were there because they wanted a better life here in Canada and there's no place to better to be except Canada. Oh, I was wishing some of you had to stay in Newfoundland because this is the best place to be. Uh, it was a very proud day from, from uh, my uncle who was the first to uh, rescue him because if he didn't, probably we would have never seen him. And the outcome would have been a lot of different if the wind had to come up and the response to be a lot of people to wash it on the shores of St. Mary's Bay and St. Chats. But going forward, I think it was very looking ahead or looking back. It was a great thing that we'd done. At the time, we didn't think it was much too. When we look at what happened going forward and all the people that settled in Canada and became, I thought you would say, uh, good citizens of Canada, tax-paying citizens, Contributing to our community, I believe it makes uh, makes Canada better because there's more population we need. Uh, what I'm hearing from uh, the few people when in 2016 had a little celebration that most of most of them are probably hoping to say all, oh, but they're never all in anything. That most people got good jobs up in Toronto and Montreal or wherever or two, and are doing well now. So hopefully that will continue. And when I'm hearing that there are children now, 35 years ago, I was 27, now I'm 62, but I'm sure the children that came over are having children and their grandchildren. The Tamil community is growing prospering in, in Canada. So I hope that uh, going forward, it's, it's a proud day for me today at 35 years. Each year we think of it, uh, it uh, come up on my Facebook again uh, this week that uh, memories comes up so you know it's always in everyone's mind and shared and people comments so all that those good for the Tamil community and all the immigrants who come to Canada you see when we grew up in a little community with hardly any people just one religion Catholics no no dark-skinned people we only read about those in a book even up to that point in time so now it was great to see that uh, that everything was working out well for everyone in uh, in Canada and uh, I suppose, I don't know what else I can say, and I, I wish everyone luck in all they do uh, going forward. I got more time? Okay, best of luck, thank you. Thank you, Rom, and I think you're about to be joined by, by Diane. We're so lucky to have both of you here. <laughs> Hi, Diane. She can hear you. Oh, yeah. 
Hi, Diane. Thank you for joining us here today. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Just one moment, please. No problem. I'm sure many of our viewers know we lost Gus a few years ago in 2018, but we were so lucky to have, as a community, developed such a strong bond with Rom and Diane and Bernadette and everyone else as well. So we're really very grateful that they're all here to join us today. Diane, you can go ahead. It is such a pleasure to be here with you today. If my father's voice could be heard, he would say, I did what any person would have done in the same situation. Unfortunately, it is not always true, as we all know. And that is why we continue to celebrate this event, because it brings awareness and opens minds and hearts to those in need, like the people who are scared. What started out as an ordinary work day, August 11, 1986, turned out to be anything but ordinary. When my father saw those two 35-foot lifeboats filled with 155 people, I'm sure he was initially shocked. But he quickly acted from his heart and mind to do what he knew he had to do in this dangerous situation. He told me that he had to simultaneously back up his boat to position it between the two lifeboats while instructing his crew to set up a boat barrier on deck so the people wouldn't panic and try to jump on board and possibly sink his, his boat. He secured each of the lifeboats to the sides of his boat while dealing with a language barrier. He also had to radio Marine Atlantic to get permission to take the people on board, as well as radio neighboring boats to help board the others, because my dad took on his boat, the children, women, and the sick. He also knew that the weather sea situation could change quickly, as they were in the area of the Atlantic Ocean locally known as the graveyard of the Atlantic. After this experience, my dad often talked about the little girl who was on, boat, on the boat that day. He had made porridge for her and she was staring up at him, afraid to eat. So he took a spoon and ate some and then he, she started to eat. He would fill up with tears telling us about this, excuse me. He often wondered what had happened to her. I heard that she was now a doctor living in the U.S. You could see how this little girl could have easily been that little boy who drowned and washed up on the beach in Turkey. No one will forget that picture. This is why it is important for us to carry on this conversation. This is a good example to show the world why we should look for similarities in each other and not the differences. And to keep our focus on solutions like Dad did, because by doing this, you can only bring positive experiences to others. Thank you, Gary and the CTC for honoring my dad over the past 10 years. But his real reward was knowing that that little girl was able to grow up in a free world where she could make her own choices and that Siva and Baskaran and all the others could build their lives, get married, have the beautiful children they did and live happy lives. Thank you so very much from all my family. God bless. Thank you, Diane. That's a beautiful sentiment and a, a very appropriate and touching point to take from today's um, today's program and Gus's life. We're going to bring up next um, a friend of Gus's who knew Gus well and was Gus's lawyer on behalf of the Fisherman Union at a certain point in time and member of parliament for St. John's East, MP Jack Harris. Thank you, Kritika, and I want to thank the Canadian Tamil Congress for uh, inviting me to be part of this uh, event today. It is extremely uh, important uh, and very memorable in Newfoundland's history, too, because I remember that day, and uh, the, the, the Tamils who were rescued were known, known in the media as the boat people, uh, and because the, it took a little while, of course, to figure out 
who they were and where they had come from. Uh, and we've, we've heard how dangerous the situation was, uh, that they were basically trafficked, uh, human, human traffickers had organized this, uh, this trip, and they left them uh, stranded at sea in a very dangerous place, nowhere near the Montreal they were supposedly heading for, and in danger of losing their lives, as so many refugees have done uh, uh, since and before then. Uh, and so the, the, uh, obviously the actions that were taken when they were seen by Gus Dalton and his crew uh, were clearly uh, resulted in saving their lives and giving them a life uh, in Canada, which was done by the Canadian people. And I think we'll hear from Jerry Weiner and the Canadian government. I know the, uh, the government of the day, the Mulroney government, were resisting uh, 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 arguments being made by some people that they that these refugees were jumping the queue and all of that sort of uh, comment that was being made. But I, I want to speak a little bit about Gus Dalton. He was a man who I already knew because he was, as an inshore fisherman, was also a leader within the uh, within the Fishermen's Union, and I represented them as a lawyer uh, at the time in, in the 80s. Uh, before I was in Parliament the following year, the following July, I was elected to Parliament in July of 1987. But in before that, I was not. But I did know uh, Gus Dalton, and, and he was uh, what they call around here a lovely man. I think Diane would uh, would know exactly what I mean. Uh, big part, partly because obviously the same uh, you know the same words and the feelings that uh, she expressed today about him and about about the uh, the, the work that was done there uh, were embodied in him as well. Uh, as he said, he was a humble he was a humble man too. He was. He said he only did what anyone would do. But uh, he's right. Not anyone would do that. Uh, but he re he represented that the best of humanity, and his own instinct was to clearly do what had to be done to save, uh, if he could, the people who he was confronted with. An impossible situation, uh, as was pointed out in some of the concerns and how the they had to make sure that the danger was abated at the same time calling on. Uh, calling on someone to rescue him. But Gus Dalton was a very well-respected man amongst uh, his peers as fishermen uh, and in the Fishermen's Union as well, of course, because he was part of the executive representing inshore fishermen as well. Uh, I knew him uh, quite well, met him on many occasions, uh, and uh, I'm very proud to have known him because I think he uh, did represent uh, all of the good uh, of humanity and, and an example of uh, in our province, uh, uh, welcoming. And we did uh, welcome people then in the, the Tamil situation that we're talking about and all of the uh, you who are uh, see him as a hero uh, and also the others who helped as well, the crew and the people who helped when he was on shore. I represent St. John's East, which is where Memorial University is, which was mentioned by your president. Uh, I uh, uh, and, and the welcoming that was given by people in assisting uh, as, as they... Uh, needed to to uh, had nothing with them, no food, no clothing, no very few belongings, uh, and uh, this was an important piece of work that uh, Newfoundlanders have been known for in the past, being a seafaring nation and uh, used to that. Uh, we also experienced that in 9/11 when the aircraft that were say, uh, coming across the Atlantic landed here, uh, and uh, we now have a, a program where. It, a Broadway musical made of some of the welcoming that was done then. So we're very proud of our own uh, kind-heartedness, uh, but the, the generosity of Canadians uh, throughout this whole issue, as Gary and Sangari pointed out, you know, there was this has not been the, the long history of Canada, and this event in 1986, uh, bringing the uh, welcome, make, welcoming the, uh, the the refugees in this particular situation. Uh, was a break from the past, it was a welcoming, a change in the immigration uh, laws was made to uh, make sure that the uh, Tamils, the Tamils who arrived, were going to be welcomed and to be allowed to stay in Canada. That was a remarkable decision, and uh, it was a uh, landmark decision uh, and followed up as not perfectly, obviously, as Gary has pointed out, but uh, something that uh, was important for Canada to do, and uh, we are the better for it. We are the better for it because we have uh, not only the 155 who came uh, in, in that uh, circumstances in 35 years ago, but the other waves of Tamil refugees and immigrants that followed it that have, are now an important part of our Canadian community. Uh, welcomed then and welcome now. 
And uh, we are also very, we're very proud of our Tamil Canadians and our Tamil member of parliament, uh, Gary Sangari as well, and others who uh, have, uh, have been members of parliament uh, from the Tamil community. So I want to uh, just express, ex join in the commemoration. Uh, it's a very important event and it's a very important uh, uh, community uh, in, in our country uh, that we hope will continue to prosper and uh, the generations to come are, uh, are, are, are welcome as well. And of the friendships that have been developed between Newfoundlanders and the Tamils uh, who are in Canada uh, is an important thing that uh, will continue. And I think the work of the film, the filmmaker that's making a documentary today with uh, uh, the descendants of the uh, rescuers and the people of Newfoundland, the communities that helped and the, uh, the, the children uh, and grandchildren perhaps of the uh, uh, the Tamils who came in 1986 are also uh, uh, most uh, uh, most welcome to continue to build on the friendships that uh, were started back in, in 1986. So thank you very much for having me and I hope uh, that uh, you all uh, enjoy the commemoration and participation in the film that's being made. Thank you, Jack, and we wish you all the best in your retirement as well. Next up, we have, at the time of these events, our immigration minister, uh, the Honorable Jerry Weiner. Hi there, Minister Weiner. Our apologies, we can't hear you. I know we've been having some tech difficulties with, with you this morning. Perhaps I can ask our host to, we'll move to the next speaker and then retry, thank you. So next up, we have um, Mr. Aral Aralaya, a, a very important community leader in Toronto and, and who went was in St. John's at the time or went to St. John's uh, at the time of the arrival of the boat to assist with uh, the arrival of the refugees. Mr. Aralaya. And just Mr. Aralaya, please make sure to unmute your microphone. Mr. Aralaya, if you can hear me, if you could just unmute your mic before speaking. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Kartika. Yes, it's, um, it's somewhat sad that uh, we are unable to hear from Jerry, uh, Minister Jerry Wiener Mills. Um, he was an important member at the time of that incident and for, for many of the decisions that were made um, hopefully we will be able to get back to him soon. In the meantime, uh, as Gary said, it's a great st story all around at the time. Since the um, denial of St. Louis um, at the um, some eight years ago, uh, this was the first instance there was a total confluence of goodness uh, flowing all around. Mr. President and members of the Board of Directors of the Canadian Time Congress, first of all, we thank you. I thank you for, on behalf of the community for organizing this commemoration event to remember that um, uh, a good deed done by uh, Captain Dalton and his crew on the 11th of August, 1986. Um, it's, uh, it, it, what we are, what we had to, there was so much to talk about it that there's only four, 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 three, four minutes, I suppose. The, it is the, how, all the people have reacted to that incident 
starting with, of course, uh, Captain Dalton seeing a very hazy image um, after seeing a, a blip in the ray in his radar and deciding to uh, throw all their uh, valuable catches and to radio the other people also to come around the the two boards and to give life to these people um, even even after so many decades um, it's still um, unbelievable to know the difficult situation how they would have met their fate if not for uh, uh, Captain Dalton and his crew. We sincerely, from the bottom of all our good wishes, we thank for that family and wish them all best of luck for ever uh, in this land. And um, what uh, what we have seen, what I have seen is that I am fortunate enough to go there that uh, that that evening um, to go there, not to meet necessarily meet the 155 people uh, to provide them. The whole uh, task was how to uh, we know that Senyans cannot handle such a big group of people from from diverse culture and we need to have to um, bring them to the big cities of toronto and montreal and we had a good good extremely good relationship with the immigration department at the time on a professional basis and um, uh, phil b Pierce, uh, at the time was the acting director in toronto um, for the Ontario region and um, did speak to him and oh, he see ever so gladly took up the matter and conveyed to their willingness to assist if the federal government will allow them to come around here. That's how it started. And what I witnessed at the time was that um, amazing uh, um, decree of goodness that was flowing through. These people, they were just, they didn't have anything um, uh, with them, nothing. Uh, and uh, they just came with the, whatever they were wearing. And uh, they were immediately uh, fed. And uh, I mean, uh, of course, it happened within the Canadian Navy. Um, prior to landing at, at St. John's and then at the Memorial University uh, being a summer holidays, um, was able to look, um, shelter them over there for days, a few days. And the, the Red Cross and all the other organization around there Bearing that it is not a large city, St. John's is not a large city like, say, Toronto. And the outflow, this we saw that uh, uh, outflow of health, and this we saw that uh, at 9 11 also, how they have react, how they react. So it is just normal for them um, in, that, in that city, in that land, in, in Newfoundland how they uh, treat the uh, people in difficulties. And it was, and the second portion of course, is how that uh, relatively, now we have such a big community. And at the time, how a relatively small community in Montreal and Toronto came out in support of these people without making any judgment call. They, um, uh, of course, we managed to bring them. Uh, my my friend, uh, Mr. Ponichami, uh, uh, he came there. He also came there with the lawyer, uh, 
one layer lower a layer i'm sorry one lower um, as well and uh, we actually ha had Ponisami and the Montreal group uh, did uh, have some communication with the uh, some of the arrivals, but my uh, my you know, total intention was how to bring them out to help them so that they can start restart their lives soon. We don't make any judgment call at all, and it it didn't make any difference whether you had come by a um, by by taking a flight or being picked up in the from the middle of Atlantic, the there were very well established practices back uh, only a few months before in May in 1986. There were the government has introduced the minister's permit system. Uh, so there was uh, there was established procedure to to cater for the needs of the Tamil refugees, or, or more properly uh, defined as the people affected by the riots in Sri Lanka. The in 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 this uh, uh, in, in this aspect is the one we want to recall the excellent. Um, and commanding leadership given by Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. And uh, there were some difficulties at the time because of the, uh, some incidents and other things. And he, the good leaders, leaders rise above uh, the difficulties, what the community sees. And he, he went all out of his way to calm the situation and to give the protection to all the people. It has been, uh, and uh, Jerry Wiener, Mr. Jerry Wiener was instrumental in that one. And um, they, they, he has taken the portfolio only about six weeks before on June 30th. And um, so it, it, it's all, everything was new, but uh, the heart was full of gold, so no issues. It has been my pleasure you, yeah. to have been, Okay, I'll add it. It has been my pleasure to join the team, and thank I you. thank you all. Thank you, and thank you for speaking up on it. It's unfortunate. I know Mr. Wiener can't um, is unable to, I guess, join us, but thank you for for speaking on his behalf too. We have up next, uh, close to the end of our program here, a champion of refugee and immigration history. Um, and CEO of a, a very important and unique museum, or Canada's National Museum of Immigration in Halifax, uh, Marie Chapman. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Katika, for this. And I really also want to thank everybody who is involved in organizing this today. And um, it's an honor to be here with all of you. I'm actually here in Halifax, which is Chibuktuk in, uh, in Mi'kma'i. So it's a great honor to be uh, in this beautiful part of the world, um, sharing a piece of the Atlantic Ocean with those of you who are right now in, in Newfoundland. You know, five years ago, I was, I had the great gift of being in Newfoundland with many of you, and I spent the weekend in awe because to hear Captain Goss and the family talk about this is what we do, and, and it wasn't special, you know, I have the luxury of working in a place where we collect stories. And I can tell you that so many people who think of themselves as everyday people have done things that have changed the course of people's life like this. And, you know, to hear you, Diana, talk about looking for similarities and not differences is just at the core of the humanity of all of us. And I think that it's, Days like today, when we reflect back on those moments and in the, in the, the moments that people make these decisions and then the impact they have in the longer term is remarkable. And it's days like today and stories like this that we at the museum save and collect because they are touch points for people in the future when they hear about these things. And then they might be in a situation like this 
to think of that guideline, to think of Captain Gas, and to think about these moments and what they can then do. And so I do think these things do pay it forward. The other thing I would just say to you is, you know, 35 years is, is such a long amount of time and a short amount of time. And, and I am grateful that you keep commemorating and that you keep telling these stories and sharing them because there's, there's so much value in having this for now, but also for a hundred years from now. So thank you for that. And finally, I just want to say that um, when I looked back, I remember the Globe and Mail articles five years ago. It was a great line from Sarajan Kanapathpile. And he, they said, you form a culture by the stories you celebrate. And I really think that, you know, Canada has definitely had some ups and downs in terms of accepting refugees and not. And we definitely have a mixed record when it comes to people on boats, especially as Gary Ann Sangery well knows and has talked about. But I think that we need to keep telling these stories and to remember them because I do think it strengthens our communities all across the country. And speaking of strengthening communities, I just do want to say a special shout out to Gary Ann and Sangery because I had the good luck of getting to know him um, like his first couple of weeks after being elected. And I just really thank you, Gary, for all that you've done to help educate me and to come and see our Refuge Canada exhibit. And, and it's leadership from all sorts of different people in the sphere, like Gary, like Captain Gus, like the families that, that keep this country strong and growing and knowing we need to get better. So I just want to thank you all. And I really hope and look forward to a 40th celebration back in Newfoundland. So until then, everybody, please stay safe and take good care as you've always done. And again, deeply appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, Marie. We have now some remarks from our Minister for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, the Honorable Marco Mendicino. Today marks the 35th anniversary of the arrival of 155 Tamil refugees on the coast of St. Schatz, Newfoundland. Set adrift on the open sea for days, crammed in two small lifeboats with no food, no water, and virtually no hope of ever being seen alive again, the refugees were rescued and welcomed with open arms by Canada. Today, hundreds of Canadians from multiple generations and all walks of life trace their roots back to this very journey. The arrival of the refugees on the decrepit lifeboats became an example of how everyday Canadians stepped up to give safety, security, and ultimately a new life and new hope to those seeking refuge from persecution. On August 11, 1986, Captain Gus Dalton and his team of fishermen from St. Schatz stepped up selflessly to rescue those on the lifeboats and became unlikely heroes in doing so. We are forever grateful to them and their families for their bravery and compassion. Today, Canadians continue to give new hope and a new chance at life to refugees from around the world as we continue to welcome them into our homes, our lives, and our communities. Whether it is Tamils who arrived on these boats 35 years ago, Syrians fleeing war, or even more recently, Afghans fleeing conflict, Canadians have time and time again done what is right at the right time. The arrival of the lifeboats on the coast of Newfoundland has become a part of Canadian history and who we are as Canadians. Canada will continue to remain a beacon of hope for those fleeing persecution and human rights violations from around the world, just as we were 35 years ago. Thank you to the Canadian Tamil Congress for making this milestone and celebrating this important part of our collective history. That concludes or is shortly concluding the first portion of our commemoration this afternoon. Coming up next is the exciting world premiere of In the Wake of Time, a brand new hybrid live documentary by Tamil filmmaker Cyrus Sundar Singh 
This 30-minute live documentary begins at the moment of the perilous arrival and dramatic rescue of the 155 Thummel refugees found adrift in lifeboats in Newfoundland in 1986 and explores the ripples of that moment through the stories carried on by the next generation of Thummels and Newfoundlanders in Canada. In the wake of time moves the live documentary online and into the virtual space, a space of gathering that we are all still presently negotiating. Please welcome Cyrus to the screen. Welcome, thank you, Karthika. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you, everyone. It was amazing to be here. I just wanted to make sure that uh, all the uh, all the cast and crew are assembled and uh, signed in. So um, can we just have a check to make sure everybody's in? Uh, our tech is Goko, Goko, let me know if everything's okay. And just want to make sure that everybody's in. Um, great. Saskia's here, Gokul's here. Okay, great. Is uh, uh, Ashwini here as well? Perfect. Okay, so without further ado, uh, welcome everyone to the wake of time. In the wake of time, I now turn it over um, to the prologue with Katia Kari Gels. Vanakam, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Through the magic of technology, we are broadcasting live to anyone privileged enough to have access to the internet. From Admirals Beach, Conception Bay South, and St. Shots in Newfoundland, to Brampton, Toronto, and Niagara-on-the-Lake in Ontario, this afternoon we will experience something special, innovative, live, and genre-bending created by director Cyrus Sundar Singh. We are all part of a virtual live documentary performed right here with subjects, narrators, musicians, smartphones, laptops, and the internet. The telling of this story also includes the audience. That's all of you. Therefore, you are welcome to comment about the story as it unfolds in real time. Please make use of the chat or comment function. The Katya Kari gals, that's me and me, will curate your comments and offer it to the telling as it unfolds. So remember, you have a voice. There will be a few technical glitches and frozen screens, but remember that we are all part of this from the inside out. We invite you to sit back and get ready. Any questions? Leave them in the chat on YouTube or Facebook. Do you want to check YouTube? I'll yeah. Check Facebook. Wonderful. So we can see your comments coming in live and please keep them coming. We will see you soon.
with our noses and each other in the belly of the cargo ship. A village born of need and circumstance, neither earth nor roots where we used to stand. Floating to the lore of the promised land, Montreal, in three to four days in the belly of the cargo ship. In the belly of the cargo ship, we held our breath, our nose, and each other in the belly of the cargo ship. The promise we'd reached Canada in three or four days. For 12, we sat in fear, huddled together, all strangers. On the 12th day, or the 13th or 14th, we lost count. We were set adrift in two lifeboats on the open sea. Strangers united in hope, 155 or 153. constantly invoked the names of our gods and hoped that our faith would carry us to shore. No land, no help, no hope. In the belly of the cargo ship. Please welcome our narrator, Ashwini, who will be our guide through this story. Ashwini, are you set to go? <laughs> Wonderful. Let's begin. On this day back in 1986, that's a long time before I was born, in this very location off the coast of St. Shots, Captain Gus Dalton went out in, in his fishing boat at about 3 p.m. local time, which is now about in Toronto. Captain Dalton noticed looming shapes in the distance waves. So, he pointed his fishing boat in the direction, went, went forward towards those shapes. Good evening. There's a big mystery off our east coast tonight. A Canadian fisheries boat is now rescuing about 150 people from lifeboats off the coast of Newfoundland. But we don't know if the ship they were on sank or whether they asked to be put off board to try to settle in Canada. In 2016, on the 30th anniversary of the dramatic rescue by Captain Dalton and three other fishermen, a character, character yellow bus carrying an excited group of Tamil Canadians from Toronto and Montreal departed St. John's, Newfoundland and headed for Captain Dalton's home in Admiral's Beach near St. Mary Bay. Amongst the group were four men who were rescued from those, the lifeboats on the way. The bus took a detour into the small fishing village of Holyrood, Newfoundland. Welcome Shiva's daughter, Omira. Hello, Omira. Hi, sir. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us today. I see uh, in the off, off in the, at the other screen, I see that your father is right there as well. We 
to you. This is great. Okay, so I, I can have you back on screen too, because otherwise, okay, it's a split screen, so maybe you want to come back. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so, um, oh, there, that's better. Perfect. Okay, so thank you for joining us. So no I really want to talk about how you learned and when you learned about this journey that your father took. Well, I mean, my dad growing up, he's always told me that he's been, he faced a lot of struggles, but I was fortunate enough to um, learn the story when we went in um, 20, um, 2011, the first time we went to Newfoundland. And so meeting Gus's family, Diane and Bernadette, and seeing the photos and everything that they collected over the years, I was able to see it in such a beautiful way um, with all the proof that they had collected over the years. So it was just, I was very grateful enough to see the story unfold in front of me, especially I, was, I wasn't that old at the time too. So seeing that and being one of the first people to be there and be like, you know, on news and media talking about the story, it was just so special to me. Um, so this is something that is a part of you, right? Yeah. But what does it, like, tell me the feelings about what it means to you, like, rather than the facts and figures. Tell me, like, what does it, what does it mean for you to have this legacy of your dad having taken that journey? It, I, I carry the story in a way where it taught me lessons yeah. because growing up, my dad's always been my mentor. He has been my role model. And so this story really gave me the lesson of two things. First lesson was that, you know, life is very short and not every day is promised. And so to live life to its fullest and give, share love and share happiness and joy and be kind to one another and be there for each other, it just means so much to me because that's the person my dad raised me to be, always to be in someone's corner. And the second one was the fact that uh, when you get that second chance in life, um, you want to live it to its fullest potential. And my dad showed me prime example of how he lived his life to the fullest potential by working hard, being motivated, and teaching me how to, you know, make my way through and, you know, make, be able to work my hardest to live my life to its fullest potential. So I, it is a very emotional story, especially because um, hearing that certain boats that came to the coast were turned back, it was just, it was obviously it was faith that my dad's boat happened to be accepted because I wouldn't be here if that was the case, if it wasn't. So it's just, it is a part of my life story. It's going to be a part of my life story till I die, you know? So it just, I'm, it, I'm very grateful. I, I'm curious that about the story that you grew up with. Uh, how do you relate that to your friends, you know, either in the schoolyard or you know when you were younger, or like how does this translate? Do you keep that? Is this something that you share with your friends, or is this something that you want to kind of share with in some instances? Um, usually, because going off of what Diane said earlier about how we focus on similarities instead of differences, and that grows love, I try to be there for all my friends and family and everyone. And I tend to tell everyone um, about this story, but it's only the people I trust, because not everyone will have the perspective that I have and that certain people I trust will have. Of course, like not everyone will see the similarities and people will see the differences, which, you know, it's unfortunate, but, you know, I rather keep it to people that will see the similarities and see the love and how much this story changed my life, right? Instead of showing it to someone that will criticize it and show see it in a different perspective, right? Is it important for you to carry this story with you forward? Of course, 100% is so important to me because um, without that, like my dad struggled a lot and this was very eye-opening for him. And even in Newfoundland in 2016, I could see his mind racing as soon as he saw the lifeboat because it wasn't, it was a lot of trauma with that, but there was a lot of relief as well that he finally made it. 
But even with the trauma of being on the boat for three to four days, we also had the trauma of facing being in Canada and not being accepted immediately by the people of Canada, right? St. John's is a beautiful place and they accepted us, but not everyone was that accepting at the time. And even right now, he was telling me of how how hard it was and seeing that relief on his face back then and now that, you know, I made it. I've lived my life to its fullest potential and the story is be being shared still to this day. So he's grateful and I'm grateful for that too. And finally, I want you to take me back uh, to that moment when you got off the bus, the school bus in Holyrood, Newfoundland, and we were all faced, uh, and you're faced with that lifeboat and, and your dad and your mom. Tell me, just kind of tell me the feeling that you had in that moment. I was what was going through your head? What was happening? Yeah, I was in disbelief because to know that um, 155 people were split into two, a half of of the group was in one lifeboat. It was just disbelief because I couldn't believe that someone would have the heart to put so many people in danger in such a small boat as well with no food, no water. And just seeing that and seeing my dad's like mind work and process everything, it was just so emotional to me because I could tell he had so much trauma and he didn't think he was going to make it, but obviously he did, which is like, god's grace and that's faith obviously and so it just it was so emotional because i didn't really i couldn't wrap my head around the fact that someone could have the heart to do something like that but i i'm so grateful that gus and the fishermen and everyone there that helped us or helped my dad um did what they did at the time because without them like my dad and those all those other people wouldn't be here right Thank you, thank you. And is there anything else that you wanted to add that I haven't asked you or your dad wants to add with you, Shiva? Um, I, I, I think we're okay. Yeah. It's okay, I already <laughs> speak. <laughs> yeah, right, very good. Okay. So thank you thank so you. much. Now uh, we're gonna go to the next section. Peace. Thank you. Good evening in Newfoundland and Labrador tonight. Relieved refugees, 152 Sri Lankans arrive in St. John's. They want to call Canada home. Rescued from crowded lifeboats, fishermen tell how they found the Sri Lankans bobbing in the ocean. Who are they? Where did they come from? And how did they end up in lifeboats only 10 kilometers off the Newfoundland coast? There's plenty of mystery surrounding the 152 refugees brought to St. John's this morning. They say they are Tamils, a minority threatened by an unfriendly political climate in their homeland of Sri Lanka, a small island off the coast of India. Jay Callanan reports on the puzzle. The fisheries patrol vessel Leonard J. Cowley sailed through the narrows into St. John's Harbor about 6.30 this morning. It was a foggy welcome to Newfoundland for 152 Sri Lankan refugees on board it. Local police, immigration and medical people were at the ready once the vessel was moored. About 10 of the refugees needed medical care, although none was considered to be in serious condition. Most of the refugees are young men in their 20s, but there are also some women. Among the refugees as well are four families and some babies. The refugees say they were set adrift from a large vessel with an oriental crew into two small open lifeboats. They say they drifted in these boats until they were picked up yesterday afternoon by local fishing boats off St. Shots on the southern shore. It's the Cup to Your Gals here, and we have a comment from YouTube. So great to hear from the next generation. We agree, and we want to hear more. Now we switch live to the Avalon Peninsula and connect with Nicole near St. Shots, where Captain Dalton spotted the lifeboats. Hello, Nicole. 
Hi, Cyrus. Okay, where are we? We are right outside Gustalton's home, and this is the Avalon Peninsula. Wow. Okay. And do I see some uh, some land on the other side? Is that the other side of the uh, the bay, yeah. or what are, what are we looking at? So right there is Little Conlon. Those islands that we see. Yeah. So okay, that's those are Colonet Colonet Islands. Islands. Okay. That's Little Colonet Island. And then I'm just going to take you okay. up and over this bank and straight through there, right from their own house, that island right there, that is Greater yes. Colnet Island. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's that, that, so it's just there. Okay. And you're in Admiral's, is, are you in Admiral's Beach? Yep. Right in Admiral's Beach. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, we're going to go, I guess we're going to go into the house and uh, in, into Gus's house uh, yep. and uh, talk to um, yep. Diane and Bernadette and Ron. Thank you. Hi, Cyrus. Yes. Hello. Hey How are you? Hello, Diane. Hello, Bernadette. Welcome uh, to our family home. Uh, inviting Thank you. Thank you for inviting us in. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to see you both again after uh, it's been five years uh, since that that we were there in your house all together with your dad and celebrating and uh, honoring him. Um, so I'm really interested because I was just uh, because Nicole just showed us that there are these two islands uh, just on the other, you know, in the bay. Can you tell me a little bit about Colonet Island? Because there's a little story that's connected to your dad. So let's talk about what Colonet Island is. Uh, Colonet Island is an island that my dad's family immigrated to in the 1800s. It's an island within St. Mary's Bay. So my dad actually grew up on a little island and the only mode of transportation was by boat. So in, 19, in 1949, uh, when Newfoundland became uh, part of Canada, uh, the, um, the government at the time wanted all these little islands to move and the people to move to the mainland. So they had <clears throat> no other choice. They were given a couple of hundred dollars each and told they had to move to the mainland. So they, most of the people settled here in Admiral's Beach. And my dad, as a young man, had to, with the little money the government gave him, I think $500, had to build a house. And he did that while he fished. He had, <laughs> it's so funny because, you know, I don't know if people realize before 1949, we were a colony of Britain, of England, and uh, very poor people. <laughs> so in 1949, when they did uh, receive some money, uh, things prospered more here. And uh, but my dad understood what it was to be out in an open boat on the ocean in many different situations. Um, can you, Bernadette, maybe you can tell us, is this this idea that in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a poetic way, your father was someone who was kind of had to leave his home for various reasons, his island home, and then he comes to face to face with other people who had to flee their island home. And so these two people meet up, you know, off the coast of St. Charles. So tell me a little bit about what that leaving was, if you remember anything that your father said about leaving from the Colonel Islands, that was his home. Yeah, about leaving the island, he was, uh, he actually kind of wanted to do it. Um, he, um, he could see the potential in being on the mainland. Uh, it was an important part. We did, um, sometimes mentioned they did kind of lose a little bit of their culture um you know what they were familiar with they were on that island for his family i guess a couple hundred years yeah probably a couple hundred years um, the, um, 
there was a big difference in the lifestyle um, once they arrived here and settled in. So as we grew up, uh, we heard um, a lot of stories as children and a lot of, uh, and, and they wrote songs and poems about leaving Calumet Island. Was, uh, so every Christmas we would hear all these songs about leaving Calumet Island. And, um, you know, there was a lot of sadness to it. And the people were very Irish because they came from directly from Ireland to this island. And then in 1955, I think they immigrated into Meadows Beach and had to start all over. There was no gardens here like they were used to on Colony Island. The subsistence way of life changed and uh, technology was changing from uh, salt fish to uh, frozen fish, which was their main economy. So, you know, they had a, it was a big time, a lot of sadness. Uh, their sisters, my dad's two sisters had to move away to New York. Um, a lot of people immigrated to the States at the time, Boston and New York, around Colonel Island, um, you know, because there wasn't much happening here. Like, it was so poor. And uh, so, yeah, so we heard all those stories. And uh, so we heard a lot of the stories through their songs, through their poems, and um, through the gatherings and communication in general, and through the food. <laughs> it was very important. <laughs> There's always the food. It was, <laughs> it was yes. captured in my food uh, as well. A lot of salt fish. Exactly. And exactly. So in a way, your father's family and your family also came here in boats. We all, you know, a lot of people exactly. have arrived in boats to Canada. They sure did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that with us. And um, uh, and thank you for being here and for it's great to keep be here to kind of commemorate uh, 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 this moment. Your father made it happen. So thank you. Okay. I, I okay. just want to make a thank comment. That, uh, uh, Nicole. Okay. Yes, go ahead. I, I just want to uh, make go this ahead, comment then. because uh, things have really come full circle uh, because as an aging population here in Newfoundland with a declining population, uh, we are actually now able to immigrate here and, and now they are rescuing us. <laughs> so I just want to leave you with that. <laughs> point. That's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you for that sentiment. Thank you. Now we're going to go outside. Uh, Nicole is still there. And uh, I think this is uh, Nicole, are you still there? Can you okay. hear me? Nicole? Yeah, Great. I'm still here. Okay. So what time is it there now? Approximately? It's, uh, it's, it's a little past 3 p.m. Newfoundland time. It's about 3.30. Okay. Okay. So it, this is around the time that 35 years ago, that when Gus was out, he actually located and found those people in those lifeboats. So we're actually time specific at this point. So uh, if you can just kind of hold that, uh, I think we have a song coming up. So I'm gonna invite Saskia in. And I'm gonna just turn off my camera for a second. Mm -hmm. Look down at the sea. Be careful now, it's just you and me. The tide rolls in for the last time. Close your eyes, the storm is passing. I may be small, but if you stand on my shoulders, we're tall, and I won't let you fall. Look behind you, the world's in flames, hiding from ourselves inside this bloody game. Look ahead, the war is raging on, but we need to figure out where we come from. I may be small, but if you stand on my shoulders, we're tall, and 
I won't let you fall. Returning to our top story tonight, the first Canadian property the Sri Lankan refugees set foot on was the long liners of four fishermen from St. Mary's Bay. Susan Newhook waited for two of the fishermen to come home to Admiral's Beach last night, and she has this report. Yeah, we're just in there, there tell you. That you never heard the album under the Java. People in Admiral's Beach were glued to their CB radios last night, waiting for the Dalton brothers to get in. Gus and Alvin's longliners finally came into the harbor around 1.30 this morning. Each of them had one of the two lifeboats in tow. Gus Dalton went out looking for cod yesterday morning and wound up being the first to sight the Sri Lankans instead. I had some nets, as far as I nets out, and uh, see how these heads sticking up at the wire, huh? 30 years ago, I see this exactly this spot. We are thirsty. This much water. I say that. I never say that. I have more water. He said, no, it's no good for Look, you have some friends who have showed up. Oh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Returning the favor, you gave them water 30 years ago. Yes. You gave me a little bit of water, I need a little water. That's right. That's right. 20 gallons. 20 gallons, he said, yeah. you drank. Yeah. Yeah. Hello again, it's the Katia Karagels chiming back in. Our earlier comment I forgot to mention was from YouTube and it was from Vidya Magendran. We have two more comments to share with everyone. First from Facebook, we have Heather Barrett. Her comment goes, hello from the CBC newsroom in St. John's. It's fascinating to see this living documentary unfold and feel the connection between the Newfoundlanders and the Tamil Canadians in Toronto. We all share this one fragile world. We have another comment coming in from Kutu Fest on YouTube. Thank you for sharing this and all the other stories to keep alive the resiliency that is the lifeblood of the community. Please keep the comments coming.
Thank you, and thank you, the Katekari gals, and thank you for the comments from the audience. This is amazing. This is part of why we do this. Uh, you're engaged, and we're engaged. Uh, one of the other fishermen uh, that Captain Gus Dalton called to help him was the late Jim Corcoran. Here now, I would like to invite and uh, introduce you to uh, two of his children, Margaret and Sally Corcoran, live from Conception Bay South in Newfoundland. Welcome, Margaret. Welcome, Sally. Hi. Hi. How, how Hi. are you and what kind of a temperature is it there today? What kind of a day are we having today? Oh, it's beautiful. It's always beautiful in Newfoundland, Cyrus, uh, except when it's foggy and raining and snowing. Um, it's, it's a lovely 21 degrees, 22 degrees. Beautiful day. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. And hello, Sally. How are you? Hi. Good. Good. So tell us, take us back to that day in 2016. Uh, this was in, in St. John's. We were all there. I was there as well. We were all there uh, for this kind of reunion that happened. And somewhere in there, one of those days that we were there, we all went out downtown to a bar. We were in a restaurant. We were eating. And then there was this, the waiter brought over a bottle of wine. And he said, it's from someone over there. It's for you guys. And I'm not even sure if I was at that same table, but it was just all of the, the, the group of Tamil um, visitors that were there. And I had realized, and then when we talked, that it was actually you that said that. So tell us why. Take us back to that moment and tell us that little story of what that connection was for you. Um, well, I guess I'll start a little bit about maybe I'll, I'll lead up with a little bit of the connection. So uh, I was only two when um, the Tamil people were rescued. So I don't I don't have any recollection of it. But um, my mom had kept a scrapbook of articles and pictures of my dad's career. He was very engaged in the fishery and he didn't shy away from expressing his opinion. So he made the news sometimes. Um, and I used to like to look at the pictures and articles and ask my dad about it and his life. And there were several stories about the, the boat people. Um, and my dad and his crew on the Mona Dibna were included in some of those stories. And I asked my dad about it because it was a very, it wasn't something that I had heard about. And, you know, very broadly, he said that Mr. Dalton had taken care of this, you know, taken care of the people that he had radioed to other boats nearby for, for support and that the fishery vessel had come to assist. Um, my, my dad and his crew had shared whatever provisions that they had to kind of help because you know, 152 people, you know, without food and water is, is a lot. And what struck me was my dad had kind of said, Imagine how you would feel in an open boat on the ocean off of St. Chats. He loved being a fisherman, but he never sugarcoated how dangerous that was. And it struck him that for people to willingly go into a boat on the North Atlantic, they had to have been leaving terrible circumstances. Mm -hmm. So that evening um, that I sent you some wine or I sent the table some wine, I was out to supper with my husband and some of our friends at um, the Fish Exchange downtown. And I had noticed, I knew that the Tamil people were, you know, visiting. They were, they were there for the 30th anniversary. And I saw a group of table and I said, I wonder if they might be part of the Tamil delegation. And I asked the waitress and she checked it out. And so I sent over some wine because I wanted them to feel welcome and to know that their triumphs had rippled further than maybe they had even realized. And I say triumphs because, you know, in the face of incredible adversary, adversity, they had prospered and grown and they were able to come back 30 years later and, and, you know, revisit all of this. So while we're marking the 35th anniversary of their survival, I think, you know, the Tamil people are not defined by this. It's just one more experience that's shaped who they are. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Margaret. Uh, so Margaret, Thank you, Margaret. So Sally, do you remember, do you have any recollections uh, back when it happened back in 1986? And did you talk about it? Um, well, I was leaving, I was left to go to school in St. John's. 
and I began all week. So I do recall about it. And the biggest thing with daddy, he would always tell us, don't be afraid to always help someone because you'll never know when you will want to help someday. And he talked about it and he couldn't get over the fact that they were dropped off in the water with nothing. Yeah. yeah. And how does this story uh, engage with you and how do you move it forward in your own communities on, on the other side from where I am? Okay, so I can see it. I have a little something here. Well, when you encounter a boat full of people floating at sea, you have to provide assistance however you are able to. That seems silly to say, but fundamentally, you help when you see someone in need. That's the moral of this story to us growing up. Daddy always said that, always help out no matter what. Um, wow, you just gave me goosebumps. Uh, um, I, I, I got really interested in the story and I think I had conversations with, with you maybe back in 20, um, 2016, but I got really interested in the story and I started reading different articles about it and just, you know, I wanted to know how people had, had done, how that they had overcome. Um, and, and one of the things that I read was that the Tamil, the refugees, they didn't like to be called the boat people. Um, I can't blame them. You know, they, they boarded boats for a better life for themselves and their families. And one thing that really struck me was that that's, that's not so different than what many fishermen here do every day. They board their boats to try and make a better life for themselves and their families. Nobody calls us boat people. I mean, we do it every day. So maybe, you know, we're the ones that have, should have that. But it, I, I don't think we can define a group of survivors by the, you know, the few, a week or 10 days or however long they ended up at sea. For me, what I take away is that when the Tamil refugees were rescued by Mr. Dalton, they became our people. You know, they were trying to do the same thing that we do. They are part of the story of Newfoundland um, and the goodness of our people. And this is a story that should be celebrated and used to shine a light on how we can help each other be better. We can celebrate the courage and the tenacity of the Tamils. And we can recognize the fundamental good of our own people um, when they reached out to help. And, and all that we can do to help each other survive and grow and to help one another when they need help. I think, you know, for me, it's about we're neighbors now. We can reach out and help each other no matter what. And it shouldn't be about, you know, this whether you're from one place or another, we're all trying to overcome something. So I think it's, um, I think it's a story that should resonate with most people. Lovely, thank you so much. And while I still have the two of you, have you ever met the Daltons? I haven't. Okay, uh, let's do that uh, virtually right now. Can, can yeah. we bring in <laughs> Diane and Bernadette? We'll have to get together for a coffee. I yes. just, I, well, now I just said to Sally we should get together for a glass of wine, but I mean, we could. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to keep it under long. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really nice to meet you, yeah. too. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. And yes. we'll hook up, we'll chat. Yeah. yeah. We'll meet. Brad used to say such wonderful things Thank about it. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And it's nice to hear your side Thank of the you, story. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I, I hope this, uh, this fuels, uh, th that coffee or that wine. So <laughs> okay. thank you all. Bye. Bye. Okay. Over to you. Um, Gokul. A little later in the program, we'll be talking with the fisherman who rescued the refugees last night in St. Mary's Bay. And after the lifeboats were taken away by the RCMP, 
the fishermen turned to the job of landing a small day's catch. It's a catch that was almost forgotten when two lifeboats appeared out of the fog. I'm Susan Newhook. The reporter that I introduced in that clip that you showed, Susan Newhook, was here in St. John's about a month ago. She lives in Nova Scotia now. And she and I went to watch whales down in St. Vincent's, which is near where all this happened, where the fishermen were from who brought all these people ashore. And uh, we were sitting on the beach watching the whales. And she said to me, how long ago was it? Was I, she, we were trying to remember the year. I mean, <laughs> we finally figured out it was the mid 1980s. She said, when that happened and I came down here reporting, I said, oh yeah, I remember that day in the newsroom. So we were talking about it, you know, just a month ago, Susan and I sitting on that beach. I mean, in, in all of our, both of our careers with the CBC, we have both covered many, many, many stories and many we do not remember, but we certainly remember that one. That was a really significant story. The 28 foot boats didn't look as if they had held over 150 people. Last night, all that was left in them was a few personal items like a man's shoe and a woman's and a child and what few navigation aids they had. Things like binoculars and a very small outboard engine. Well, one of the things that I did every day, every morning, was I scanned the newspapers. I was always reading everything, even in the, the classified part of the newspaper. And I saw um, something from the Canadian Coast Guard that said they were selling to the highest bidder. They were going to sell the two lifeboats, the oars, life jackets. I can't remember what other things connected to the boats, but also a Tamil Bible. A Bible. And I thought, wow, that Bible. And I, I, I thought to myself, somebody's going to buy those lifeboats and, and things, but they're not interested in the Bible. And the Bible's probably going to be thrown away or lost or something. And I thought, this is an important object that belonged to one of the people that was rescued in the lifeboats. They brought it with them from their home. They carried it to Europe and then eventually here and then dropped it in the boat and, and got off the boat and forgot about it. So I bought the Bible for $5 and everything else went to fishermen, I think bought all that other stuff. I actually uh, was able to find a receipt that uh, Anne had uh, been given by the Canadian Coast Guard and it said $5 sold to Anne. Um, it was a one Tamil Bible for five dollars, that Tamil Bible, as she said, is now at the it's now at the archives at uh, Memorial University. At this point, um, I'd like to uh, go to the next piece, please. Next. Hi, it's the Katikari gals. We're back to update you um, on what's happening in the comments. We've had so much, honestly beautiful beautiful comments so much love flowing in from all the viewers so much love for all the speakers and the stories that are being shared mm -hmm. um, and we just will offer you a comment oh, again from Vidya Magendran on YouTube her comment goes the people of Newfoundland show us time and again how generous they are 9-11 Tamil refugees the Titanic I'm sure there are other stories too which begs to ask the question Whose stories are we telling? Back to you. Green is my dad. He survived the war in Sri Lanka. He survived the dangerous journey across the Atlantic Ocean in the belly of the cargo ship, and then survived for three days without food or water in the lifeboats until he was rescued. There were about 75 people in each lifeboat so that no one could really move. If they did, the lifeboat could capsize.
Thank you, Ashwini. Uh, I would like to now um, turn you from our narrator into one of our, our, our guests. So can you come back on, please, you and your dad? Great. Um, welcome back. Um, so, so this is a story that you have helped us to tell, and that includes your father, right? So tell us about how this story came to you. When do you remember receiving this story from him or from anybody else? So it was like a couple of years ago. I was probably like eight years old. Um, about that time, my dad told me about a story where, um, so basically he came on this boat, but something like wrong happened to the boat. And so this man um, called um, Captain Bolton um, helped him by um, taking him to this place that could help him survive. And then he helped them by giving them food and water and stuff like that. Cause uh, um, before it Dol uh, Captain Dalton um, helped them, he had no water and food. So, um, in my like point of view, this uh, is like means a lot that Captain Dalton helped my father. Can you tell tell us? Can you share with us uh, what grade you're going into, Ashwini, uh, in September, and about how many uh, siblings you have? So I'm going to grade seven on September 9th, and I have three uh, older brothers. And does this story about your father's journey, does that ever get shared amongst you? Do you ever talk about it with your brothers at all as a family? No, not really. But this one time when I was eight, which I just shared, we, um, we all talked about it, my siblings and my dad and me. And um, my brothers and I were really happy that Captain Dalton came to help him and hit like other of them, other people that were with him. Yeah. Now, there are probably parts of the story that you were unsure of or you wanted to find out, especially from your father. Do you want to ask him those questions now? Can you ask him that question and see where we can fill some more in of this story? Uh, sure. I had this one question. Okay. Um, I was wondering why he went on the boat. Because I live in uh, Germany about one and a half years. But I can even go another city from my city. So plus I can I can even work anywhere because I'm in the camping. Um, they give you some food money and uh, um, I try to think about myself. I had to do something myself. So that's why I talked to my brother, um, elder brother, younger brother. They share money with me about 5,000 5, in German mark. So I told him to, I'm going to uh, Canada because my brother told me to you, you go into Canada, then you can study English, you can make money. So you change your life, so better you have to go. So that's why I tried to, I came with my ship. So 1986, August 11. So uh, as soon as I came here, uh, they split in uh, 90 people from uh, from Nepal and to Montreal and 60 people to uh, Nepal and to Toronto. Uh, I know English from Toronto, so that's why I came to uh, Canada, Canada, Toronto. So because I want to study, I want to make money. So that's why my plan. But as soon as I came, I already started work like two jobs, so that's why I don't have time to go to study. I make money. I only sleep like a couple hours. And seven years I work like a hard work. And then I went to marry about, I got three boys and one girl. Still I'm working 35 years, continue. I never stop my job. So this, this I love Canada so I like, I tell everyone like even Europe, Sri Lanka, about Canada, best in the world. So I love, I love it, Canada. I live with my family. I am very happy to live. Anything else? Thank you. 
No problem. Yeah, thank you. Ashwini, Ashwini, have you ever been to your, the, the country that your dad's from? Have you been to Sri Lanka? Uh, yes, actually. It so was tell me a little like, bit about that, that trip. Back. Um. So when I went there, it was like lots of fun stuff. And like, so a lot of um, his family members came. I could like, like I never seen them before. And that was good to meet a new person. And there's like a lot of nice animals. I love Take like much. dogs. I love, and he had like puppies and I really loved them. I was asking him if I could take one home to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just realized it was going to take a lot of money to bring them like to a different country. So <laughs> it was a fun country. That's right. And I love the weather actually. So, yeah. Okay. And finally, I wanted to ask you before we go, Ashwini, is how do you pass on this story or will you pass on this story of your dad's journey to your children or your friends um, friends yes and right now i am to a lot of people when i was talking about like how he survived from sri lanka germany to canada and stuff without food or water or help so Wonderful. So thank you so much. And I've got one more thing for you before you go. So come back after the video. Ashwini, you got the first line in the in the last bit, okay? Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, could you please roll the next bit, Gokul? Thank you so much. And uh, do we have, uh, we would like to have um, Ashwini and the Katekari girls up, please. Okay, and Ashwini, you have one question. We're gonna have, you're gonna ask this question before you go. Okay, go ahead, ask the question. Uh Okay, so my question for my dad was why, how did, what happened to the ship that he was on at first when coming to Canada on the petty ship, big ship that you were on? Uh, pretty uh, cheap, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I came with uh, cheap 152 people to from uh, German, my city, Primahaven. I came about uh, 12 and days, I think, uh, inside a uh, big ship. And then I came by the boat uh, at least three days. I didn't get, get any water or uh, any food inside the boat. Um, even I can even move from each other. And because a lot of water come in, somebody take a bucket and throw it inside the sea. So something like a very scary. We don't see any person to, to catch us. So three days we are rounding, rounding inside the Atlantic. So we don't see anybody. Then one person sees something like, look like something over there, all the way far away. And, uh, and then we follow the things because almost the gas all run out and everything within three days. Um, we, every night we run without uh, gas. So just, and then after they see something came close by, close by like a small boat. And then we already uh, went to close by and uh, Darton. So he, he came and asked for us and they asked me to, where I come from, we are coming from Sri Lanka. So how long can we tell them to, one person talked about uh, the person, um, almost one month, we are running here five days without uh, anything. And then we jump over in the boat, water, and we take uh, Coke and Fred bread, something like that. Uh, even without him, we we not, not gonna life now. So, we are very lucky to 
and he catch us. So uh, that's why we see the light now. And uh, now I'm already working hard, married, three boys, one girl. I'm very happy to life. There you go. So, and she's there with, and she's here with you today else? to 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 talk about this story. Yeah. Uh, and thank you so much. Uh, and I'm going to let you go actually. My life later on. No okay. Problem. Thank you so much and thank you for being with All us. Right, I think you may or may not need to go swimming. So uh enjoy your swim, Ashwini, and thank you yeah. very much. And now off to the Katigari gals. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katya Karagels. Um, we have a few final words for everyone listening. Did you know that the lifeboat has Canadian roots? The lifeboat originally belonged to the mothership Regina Maris, a Canadian cruise ship that sailed on the St. Lawrence River. In 1985, the Regina Maris was sold and sent to Bremerhaven, Germany to be retrofitted Three of its lifeboats were sold and found their way onto the cargo ship, the Orge, which left the West German port of Break on July 28, 1986, with 155 Tamil Sri Lankan refugees on board. The moment the lifeboat unloaded its strange cargo in Newfoundland, it was discarded and its value as a life-saving vessel was dismissed. It was auctioned off by the Canadian Coast Guard and was soon forgotten and lost to history. For the next 30 years, the lifeboat continued its new life working as a fishing boat. It was bought, sold, and owned by four different local fishermen until that summer in 2016, when Cyrus helped reunite the lifeboat with its former Tamil passengers in Holyrood, Newfoundland. So. I ask you, is it not destiny that a Canadian lifeboat sold to a German cargo ship would return home carrying its intended strange cargo? How cool is that? And before we go, we're gonna add one last comment from Facebook. This is from Merit Norway. They say, thank you so much for this conversation. And, and we, we have to say, Thank you all for listening. In the belly of the cargo ship we held our breath, our noses, and each other. A village born of need and circumstance. Not earth and roots where we used to stand. Voting to the lure of the promised land, Montreal. In three or four days. In three or four days. In three or four days. In the belly of the cargo ship. We held our breath, our noses, and each other. In the belly of the cargo ship, we held our breath, our noses, and each other. In the belly of the cargo ship, we held our breath, our noses, and each other. Floating to the lure of the promised land, Montreal, the promise, we reached Canada in three or four days. For twelve we sat in fear, huddled together all strangers. On the twelfth day, or thirteenth, or fourteenth, we lost count. We were set adrift in two lifeboats on the open sea. Strangers united in a hundred and fifty-five or a hundred and fifty-six. A promise we reach Montreal in four hours. For three days, we drifted in our lifeboats with no food or water. We were lost, cold, and hungry. No land, no help, no hope. We constantly booked 
the name of our gods and hoped that our faith would carry us to shore. No land, no help, no hope in the valley of the cargo ship. Oh.